Hello everyone and welcome to the Break the Game Weekly number 20 for Mortal Gates of Pyre. I'm your host Dominic or Shadow Fury, whichever you prefer. And we are going to have a bit of a smaller tournament today. 1v1 tournament post massive patch. There was a huge patch that came out just yesterday. Some big changes like the shift to Unreal Engine 5 and a bunch of smaller but still important changes to units, to the economy, to the general quality of life. It has been a pretty fun day of just playing around with all these new changes and we are gonna have a really fun tournament of the players experimenting with that as well so first up we are going to have Tomathor and Itlander go at it one of that by magical while Wajizo and Mr. Cream other side of the bracket will be fighting each other to fight Santa Claus our last week's champion who finally broke out of their Second place streak to get a win. So we will have that following. I mean, probably, I think, Itlander, Thomas and then after that we'll see what the other side of the bracket's up to. I mean, why is it so... They really like going for Orzum, and really, really, really liked going for very delayed plays. So I expect that it's probably going to be less of an issue. Like before, what would happen is that they basically constantly have like they would have issues where they would be going for very delayed, very towery play, which would take forever. That's been kind of that's been more or less fixed up. So they should be okay. Like, we should probably not see quite as much of a long wait time as we had seen before. But, first off is going to be Tomathor against Deadlander. Oh, not magical. That was a... thing. Pay no attention to that. Anyhow, Tomathor Needlander on the brand new map, Canyon. There's a map that has just been introduced to the pool as of last patch, but it wasn't really working. Like, you'd play it and the tower in your base would attack you. So now it's actually properly working. Which is great. So. No. Oh. So, we are looking at one of the first... 1v1 maps originally made for Immortal. This is completely original, not in the Vanguard prototype. It is an entirely new design. And it also shows something of what is the current 1v1 approach, which has been a lot of connect bases in multiple directions. See, so you have your main base here, out to a natural, and then a third off to the side, but also a third up front, and then branches off again into another kind of wrap around the side or team to the center it's just it's the spirally approach we see on the new frontiers design as well which we probably will see frontiers the old test map has been rather thoroughly redesigned which i hope we do see it because it is significantly different and significantly better than it used to be but both of them have this design pattern of being very much spirally where the players are forced to make choices on what expansions they take whether they go towards the center or continue to spiral around. Canyon definitely is the most archetypal of that. Tomathar, going for what was previously the more typical approach to Ajari. Set up your expansion, set up your Legion Hall. Similar to Eatlander, though Eatlander is going for it a little bit more tech-wise. Earlier double ether compared to Tomathor, who is just a little bit faster on the Legion Hall. Going to be a little faster with Zapari, going to have an easier time setting up. Not going to have as easy a time getting to tech units, which matters a lot. Saushin, Najari's healer support unit, got significantly reworked and is much more effective in direct combat. Much, much more effective in direct combat. Like, as in, if you are used to the way that Saushin used to work in direct combat, you are going to need to completely rethink the way that you thought things worked it's it's not even close 
the heck? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's not even close to what it used to be. There is a significant change. The biggest change, basically, is that now... Now both these players are going to have the up are going to be just using them as direct fire units. Like they're not going to be trying to go in with, you know, doing much of finicky casting or whatever. It's no longer a heal. It is a your opponent's units don't deal as much damage field when they go for their auto attack. So both Tom and Neatlander will be able to use them as frontline troops, frontline shock troops. Whether they do remains to be seen. Again, it's something Neatlander will have an easier time setting up given the early tech path, but something Tomathur has actually gone for first. Eatlander, instead of deciding to go for early Dervish, figuring that they were going to be fighting up against a bunch of Sapari for their opponents, and Dervish will be able to wipe out Tomathur Sapari. Eatlander, much more keen on running up the tech tree. Tomathur, much more keen on getting to use those brand spanking shiny new Shalshin. Eatlander does have a slight advantage coming in that much faster. They've, they definitely have the initiative when, in this early attack. Time without a rear guard, without a rear guard will be caught with the pants down. By getting this round on this attempt to kill the Legion Hall. Eatlander is forced to retreat. They did force to cancel the Legion Hall. They got rid of the motors. Okay, so that Eatlander got a decent amount of damage done. They, they slowed down Time without attempt to wall off. But that appears to be a reactive wall-off. So Tomathor's ability to build units will be a bit slowed down. Their ability to wall off this side was not the main goal. Though, considering these are running around from the, from the left side, of the, or from the south side here, it does seem that Tomathor, they're going to want that wall, and they're not going to get it. They are not going to get it. Eatlander continuously applying pressure, forcing that wall into a no-go position. There's the Saoxing, though. He had Lander Sapari, unable to attack as effectively as they had been, forced now to completely get out of there. Like this, Tomathar will finally be able to reinforce this, set up a wall, and actually stop any further incursions from the south side of the natural. Which is good for them, because that was becoming a problem. Tomathor, I think... Tomathor's going for a counterattack. Tomathor, you might want to be careful there. Your opponent is a... Uh, Bit better prepared than you think when it comes to stopping your forces. Well, are they gonna go for it? But they okay. Well, slow down the dervish. Yeah, it's the other thing. It's it's slow attack speed, slow movement speed. The anything the south starts attacking is going to be stuck in that fight for a little while. Not great for dervishes. Not great for if you, if you want if. Eatlander is trying to get those dervishes to be, you know, just skirmishing around. Running around trying to attack from multiple sides. They're, they can't do that, but they've been slowed down. Tomathor. Catching them almost off guard. Eatlander gets a surround. Tomathor forced retreat. Not getting a significantly useful position. He goes to the heavens. He's just trying to find a little bit of extra damage. Eatlander responding in kind. Tomathor's army, much smaller than Eatlander's, is being routed. Almost completely destroyed. One last Saoshin. Goes back! Not what you want there. Tomathor losing almost all of their army. Does have some more on the way. Switching over to Zephyrs. Should be reasonably effective at dealing with the Dervishes. And the Saoshin Sapari could cause problems to a Zephyr-heavy army. But the Dervishes will not be a concern. So Eatlander's force, primarily composed of Dervishes, is going to struggle against the Zephyrs. At least when there are enough of them. At the moment, Tomathor, a little bit, a little bit low on the numbers. Eatlander taking advantage of this assault to go for their third expansion. And Tomathor, similar. Both players realizing, you know, on this on this map, it's not hard to go for a third expansion. It is not along the main line of scrimmage, or main, not, sorry, not across it. It's not along the main line of attack. So you're not going to be finding that base unless you look for it. Now, to be fair, Eatlander is scouting it out. Or has scouts near enough by they could. Same time. Tomathor 
is desperately needing that, honestly. They're They've been falling behind in army numbers for a little while now, though they do have a turnaround. Their forces are up against wardens. They're like they're heavily anti-ground army. They're trying to have to deal with more and more air units. The wardens to deal with. They have two Angelaria from Eatlander. It's really a commitment to that air air game. If they once they see the absolvers, Eatlander can easily pivot into an air game and stop it. Whether or not matters, going for Tomathor's third expansion. Tomathor has nothing to defend. Losing the third expansion right away. Neatlander starting out this fight with a significant advantage has won their goal. They don't need to stay in this if they don't want to. They, if they think they can take some some units out, that's worth it. But again, Tomathor, they lost this fight. Neatlander got what they wanted and able to get away clean. Inlander switching into Arc Mothers. Actually, a little bit of support. Actually, a little bit of damage reduction, as they always have been. Nothing significantly has changed with Arc Mothers. Just, well... So, a thing you'll notice that pretty soon is that the supply count right here. You have a supply count right here in the corner that tells you how much supply that units have. And the thing about the supply cap right now, if you've been following this game for any length of time, you know that the maximum has been 160. Which means Eatlander would be at about two-thirds of their max- actually about three-quarters of their maximum supply. This is no longer the case for 1v1. For 2v2, it still is, per player. For 1v1, that has been increased. So now armies can be about 50% bigger than they used to be in 1v1. So Eatlander, what we're looking at now, is half of their potential army size. In terms of supply. Not three quarters. So just to put that in perspective, Tomathor is already now like 50% unit power and unit supply behind. That could easily become a three-fold difference in army size if Eatlander continues to build up units. And Eatlander is not able to really calm that either instead choosing to go for a fourth base which similar timing to Eatlander Tomathor and Eatlander both just trying to find their approaches for economy when their opponents are not attacking it's the question of whether or not that's going to matter as Tomathor on a bit of a last stand defense of their third expansion Eatlander with the Ark Mothers providing that extra little bit of damage reduction able to just wipe out Tomathor's forces the Absolvers cannot do as much damage as they used to at range, and we're seeing the effects of that. That is a new patch change. Absolvers just... Absolvers are only effective against... You know, like, Tomathor's Absolvers, they were only effective when Eatlander was coming up close. So Eatlander, as long as they stayed at a distance, those Tomathor's Absolvers could do nothing. Or next to nothing. Now Tomathor's army is unable to do much, as Eatlander starting to run roughshod over the west side of the base, or west side of the map. Warden finds that al or finds that fourth base, which means Eatlander, they can just march right up onto it. Eatlander slowly but surely building up their next wave of forces on top of all this, but they haven't hardly lost anything, and they're playing a Jari. They could, they could deliver from evil if they need to, just teleport everything back. But honestly, they don't really need to. On top of having the next little bit of hallowed ground there, which means that Eatlander's forces are healing up nicely. So Eatlander, they're doing the Ajari thing. They're healing, they're damage redu reducing, they're saushining. Actually, no, they're not saushining. They've they've lost all their saushin. But they were saushining well enough. That this is Eatlander playing Ajari as Ajari was meant to be played. Tomathar. Finally finding a little bit of room to defend, having switched over heavily to Zephyrs. Able to actually fight everything now. It's just in the numbers available, that's a tough call. Tom was doing a reasonably good job focusing fire on the priority units. Reasonably good job teleporting away, or windstepping away the damaged Zephyrs, but it's altogether not enough. Tom Thor's army simply is too small to stop Eatlander from taking out the natural expansion. 
Tomthor's army is just too small to stop Edelander from taking everything. Edelander on the victory trail as they take game one. An absolutely dominating victory there from Edelander. Well, we will see how this continues as Edelander is, I would say, the stronger player. I mean, that, that was kind of known to begin with. Just a question of what is going to happen for the next map. Where's Tomathor going to go? Like, Tomathor gets the choice. And they weren't doing too badly. They, they definitely had the understanding, theoretically, of what they should do. It was just that the... It was a bit outdated. Like, the use of Absolvers is probably not great right now. They're definitely weaker. Like, for defending a position, they're okay. But even then, it's not ideal. Well, for now, we're going to be moving on to Lost Province. See what what Tomathar has up their sleeve for Lost Province. Okay. So Lost Province, very familiar map to anyone who's been playing for any length of time. It is not a map that needs an introduction, though it does look a little bit different than before. Again, we, the update to Unreal Engine 5 has changed a couple things. You'll notice it's a bit brighter. That's because Unreal Engine 5 is really cool about how it does indirect... Like, So, one of the biggest features of Unreal Engine 5 that is a new thing, well, new-ish thing, is real-time indirect lighting. This existed in Unreal Engine 4, but it wasn't quite as robust. Certainly wasn't really default on. It's a lot more prominent in 5, and... So right now, Lost Province is very bright, as you'd expect for what is effectively a desert plain. Or desert, not plain, desert... Mesa, really. Yeah, it's, it's bright. It is bright, it's shiny, and light off the ground is reflecting onto units, which is how light works, but not always in video games. So it's kind of cool. It definitely has... Definitely is bright. Anyhow, Idlander switching over to Zul while Tomathar sticking to a Jari and sticking to a... Now, early expand into single ether military. So early Sapari. Presumably early Saoshin. We didn't see Saoshin do a whole lot last time. We might see them do something this time. That was a question part, both of numbers and of tech advantage on the Atlander side. The Atlander, their shift to Dervishes helped a lot, and Tomathor did overextend. Like, Tomathor defended okay, but then they overextended, which, I mean, that did them no favors. Let's be perfectly honest. That, you don't, you don't want to overextend. You will lose units. You will die. So yeah, Eatlander taking full advantage of new texture change. So texture change for Aru means, you know, you can get Amber Wound before Godheart, which means Eatlander can get an early Icor rush that Tom Thor is going to have to have in the back of their mind. Tom Thor does not appear prepared for this. They are getting preparations ready. They do have the Reliquary coming up. They can get units able to counter the Icor. But can and will and time are two very different things. Elander Go for the run by. Just figures Thompson's gonna go for Pyre correctly and goes for the run by. That is gonna hurt. That's gonna hurt a lot. Now if Tomathor has their head on their shoulders, they will take advantage of one of the other changes, which is that they can stop worker production. Both players can, actually, but it's just relevant for Tomathor because they can attack. Worker production is now toggleable. This has been a planned feature forever, and is now in. So Tomathor could avoid taking... 
too many losses from this run by, too many more than they'd absolutely have to. Certainly do manage to defend themselves just fine. Zephyr's coming in very early as well, which means the Ikor, their effectiveness is going to be limited. The Sapari are going to be taken out, but the Zephyrs are going to be able to provide that little bit of extra defense. If it gives the Atlander pause, that will be a win for Tomathor. Atlander just focusing to regroup. They don't want to go in quite yet. Give it a bit. Once they find the right time to go for an attack, then we will see that attack. Of course, the longer they wait, the more Tomathor will be ready for this, and if Tomathor is ready for this, Eatlander can't do much. For their part, Eatlander does have enough. They could they could pivot into resonance if they want to. They've gotten the tech they need, so Eatlander isn't in trouble. It's just more a question of whether they. Whether they call the army positioning, whether they call the army composition. I mean, Tomathor's positioning is not doing well for them. Unfortunately, sending their entire army to scout left them open for Edelander to come in for a massive attack. Their entire army coming in here, wiping out all the moats. Dervish coming back to try to help out. Will be able to stop the Bone Stalkers, but solid micro from Edelander surrounding the Dervish, stopping their splash and doing a whole lot of damage. Not only that, Hunting Ground is set up. Atlanta taking full advantage of that fact. Gets a damage bonus. Wiping out everything Tomathor has built up. Elander losing hardly any of their Ikor. A bunch of the Bone Stalkers do go down, but the Ikor, they remain. They remain a major threat. We'll see what the Zephyrs are able to do, but only two Zephyrs. Tomathor won't have enough of an army to significantly slow down Elander. Elander has this natural expansion completely at their mercy. Reinforcements are on the way for Tomathor, but they're simply not going to come up in time. Tomathor knows it! And that... Oops. Tomathor did not win last time. Edelander won last time. And Edelander won this time as well! Which means Edelander has taken the series 2-0. Good games from Edelander. It's calling in chat, in the Discord. And that is our first series for today. And I'm not sure if we have... No, I think their next match might be a bit delayed. So it looks like Wajizo and Mr. Kareem have had one game. So we're going to go with Magical and Eatlander. That is a thing we can do. Because we can do it right now. All right, Magical versus Eatlander. And this is going to be probably a bit of a reversal of what we saw last time. We are going to see the new map or new version of Frontiers, though. And that is exciting. I've played it on that a little bit, but 
We have not seen it on stream. It's a little bit rough, to be fair. The art's a little rough. It's gonna... It's getting it improved. But the layout. The layout is so much more playable than it used to be. Uh, let's go. Magical and Eatlander setting up for an Aru mirror. Magical back to Mala? Hmm, okay. That's because I've been playing a lot of Zul recently, but hey, new patch. New patch. Changes to Immortal. Changes the systems. Changes to Mala. And changes to the map. Oh, never mind. The art's not quite so rough. Yeah, there's, a few, there's a few bits, but it's it is a map. That's actually very defensible. Like this this opening section, yeah, very, very defensible. Which was always kind of the case with Frontiers. A bit more pronounced than the current design. In the main change is just that the center is a lot more open. Like instead of having the lines of rocks across the center. It's, you know, just this one ramp, or this set of ramps, like, kind of opposite direction, but not really blocking things off. So much more room to move around. Much less of an emphasis on that expansion over here either, because before, it was like, you had this little pocket expansion in the corner that led to this giant ramp that was all on its own. Now that's folded more into the center of the map, and also the natural Rather than have this weird situation where it's like which base is your natural between one the one that's effectively over here and the one that's now the natural. Yeah, so just generally a bit more open, a bit more maneuverable. Significant improvement, I'd say. Now Eatlander. Eatlander magical both going for just what has been the standard Aru approach? The early expansion, double ether into early altar, or not early, but into altar, and now into early Icor. Both of them know that the other's going early Icor, so there's not a whole lot of point going mass early bone stock or mass early mass hunter, because the Icor just counter that. So we're probably going to see a bunch of Icor running around between the two players for the next few minutes. As Magical actually found out that after four minutes, you can get Ikor's speed upgrade. And that is a significant boost to their damage power. Or their damage potential, harassment potential. Itlander has gotta be careful, having gone more for Bone Stalkers, that they don't get they don't get hit by a run by. Magical is fond of run bys. So it's absolutely a threat that Magical can produce here. So that Magical does have a little bit more of a delayed start. Like, Yidlander will have some power to defend. And can drop down Zol if they want to. Now once they take this camp. Although that camp is actually a Pyre Miner. Still, it will help. It's just not going to be as immediate. Magical, on the other hand, getting that early Ikor speed. So by the time Icors get around to Eatlander's force, they or Eatlander's base at least, they will be speed Icors. Ooh, did, they, did they spot it? I don't think they spot it. No, I don't think they, I, they completely ran by. What the? Why am I not getting? Huh? That's weird. I don't have the thing. Oh, okay. Anyway. Two ships passing in the night. So that's what I wanted to say. Two ships passing in the night. But Eatlander gaining the right core up in time, so Magical's not going to be quite so able to get that run by. At least in theory, the speed Icors are up for Magical. Eatlander's a little bit slower on that draw. If they can defend, they win. Like, Magical going for the early attack. Itlander. They... I don't think they got that early Pyre, which Magical has not gone for. But the defense may not be available. Magical able to push past Itlander's forces, surrounding their Icors. 
taking out one at a time, systematically ripping apart Elander's force, but Elander did manage to inflict serious losses on Magical's army. Though, Magical inflicting serious losses, even more serious losses on Elander's economy. Elander Spines trying his best, but it's just 1v3, simply not enough. Not. Elander Spines are not hardy enough to hold this back. Thrums on top of that Magical coming in at all angles. And Elander is not prepared to defend against this. They don't have any defense other than the main tower. They don't have anything that can shoot up. They are hardly anything they can shoot down. Single Ikor comes up, and that is not enough. Magical throws in... There's a Magical takes the game as Eatlander throws in the towel. That was your four-minute speed, Ikor, for the day. Because... Oof. Well, okay, it's not the only one for the day. Let's be honest. That's, that's going to be a... Oops. That is going to be a. That's going to be a bit of a problem. Well, with that, it's going to be Canyon on Eatlander's request. Now it is game two. Eatlander having the map of their choice. Magical deciding this time they want to go for a Jari. Both players going for a Jari. Would appear that a Jari is very popular on Canyon. So we see we saw before Eatlander and Tomathor, where Eatlander was able to just wipe out Tomathor. Basically by switching into dervishes and gradually building up an army. Now let's see what Magical does. I expect it's going to be mass Saushin. Like just the entire army Saushin. All day. All day, every day. Saushin. Hmm. Well, let's see what happens, because... I mean, Inlander did get caught by surprise there. Magical is able to hold that. Then, from here on out, Magical should have a little bit of a harder time. We did see before, both players did want to go double Ajari. And they both did. So double Ajari it is. Anything tricky up people's sleeves? No, oh, Magical going for super early ether. They are likely to go for Mass Saushin, so that tracks. The Atlander going for early expansion instead. Oh, wow. Really double. Do you really need that much? Like for the Reliquary and the Saushin cost? I mean, I'm assuming. Wow, Magical going. Highly aggressive here. Wait, are they going for Soul Foundry cheese? Are they doing it? I mean, we haven't seen it on this map yet. We've only seen the game on this map at all, so that does make sense. But still, we have not seen that on this map yet. But apparently, we are going to have some Saushin cheese. Or not Saushin, sorry, some Soul Foundry cheese. Certainly was the way to go on Lost Province in the last patch. See if Magical's banking on Eatlander, not expecting it to start from this patch. As if 
I expect Magical is thinking, oh, Eatlander's not going to expect cheese. I mean, it's just the first game. Okay, it's not going to be Soul Foundry. It is going to be Saushin. It's going to get mass Saushin inside of Eatlander's base, because that's what we're... That's what it looks like. And Eatlander has no clue. They're not looking the, anywhere near that expansion. Trying to figure out if Magical is setting up stuff over a little bit farther, a little bit too far to the north. The Magical has got free reign here. Like, Hitlander has no idea. Reliquary is almost done. Once that's done, Magical can just start setting up Saushin. Possibly Saushin Zephyr? Saushin Zephyr on top of Fire Singers. Okay. Couple of Saushin in the base just to defend. Couple of Saushin in Hitlander's base to actually deal the damage. Eatlander wisely walling off one half of this choke point. Make it a little bit harder for Magical to get in, but not by much. I mean, Magical's basically got free reign here. Eatlander does have the Red Reliquary building up, but it's... is it in time? Certainly doesn't look like it. Couple of Saushin right around the corner. Magical not even waiting. Not waiting until they get everything. They're going hard immediately. Taking what economy they can, taking this expansion as quickly as possible, though Saushin aren't really the best suited for this, but hey, set up the Fire Singer behind that, and that still does the trick. We are seeing the, um, well, developed Cannon Rush, effectively. The Saushin don't have their leap now. Second set of Saushin are coming along, which will have the leap. Magical should be able to slow down Eatlander's force from here, but not going to be able to get that turret. Magical, more reinforcements coming in here. Find that extra little bit of support. There's that slowdown. Oh, oh man, those Absolvers cannot do much. Deliver for me a little four Hitlander. I mean, that'll just... Yeah, they won't really move them all that much. In fact, that kind of just breaks up formation. Magical able to just completely exploit that. Fortunately for them, they did take a lot of damage coming in. Now, Saushin... Start to see a bit of the weakness. <laughs> Magical struggling a bit. Eatlander has been able to push them back for the time being. They have to burn a lot of power in the process. But they did manage for now. Eatlander, what reinforcements do you have? More Absolvers coming in. Though, again, Absolvers are possibly a little undertuned this patch. They're not, no, they're not useless. Yeah, I guess Melee actually they're pretty good. But even then, only one of them is simply not enough. And now, Magical reasserted dominance in Eatlander's base. Eatlander signing to respond in kind. Stone Saushin come up. Set up. Get that slowdown. And now Magical stuck in. Trying to beat back Eatlander's Saushin. It's just not enough. There are simply not enough forces coming in. Magical... They are expanding behind this, but their expansion is quite delayed compared to Eatlanders. And Eatlander has not really lost any economy in the process. Like, their actual economy has not shifted one bit. They lost like two modes at the start and none since. Eatlander able to get some solid surrounds and magical. Magical trying to regroup, trying to find position to actually work from here. Eatlander simply not giving it to them. Magical being careful to avoid giving away their little proxy, but Eatlander is wise to it. Spots when they need it. Magical realizing they have to defend, goes back, drops Heaven's Z just to help them out. They can reinforce this approach. They might actually be able to hold off Eatlander's defense. But having lost almost everything, Magical has no way of no real way of defending this. Like this is. This cheese is over. Magical has not been able to deal significant damage, and Eatlander has an economic lead. Econ economic and military lead as a result. Magical as a follow-up. Does have a Soul Foundry available. Have not shifted into presumably Dervish, so they're going to use it at all for anything besides setting up Angelarium. Now, Eatlander has bought themselves a couple minutes to just roam about the map, 
deal some damage, possibly expand again. Honestly, expanding again would likely be a really solid choice right about now. And getting their tech going as well. Magical looking to regroup. But it is going to take a little while. They are shifting into Angelarium tech. Which means that'll take that much longer and Ian will have that much more time to just go about the map, grab some pyre, and really have free reign. I mean, really from here, it's a question of what the lander does tech wise because like right now magical is setting up for air tech they could get some sentinels to help deal with the wardens they could get wardens of their own itlander is ahead economically but the question is if they're going to be able to push through this attack i mean the choke point here for magical doing them some favors but they've lost their own saush and they've Lost a significant amount of health out of their army. He had Leonard. Looking to find a solid position. Drops the Heaven's Aegis. And the Absolvers are right in the thick of the army. Fortunately, again, they're not quite as strong as they used to be. Without, They need that support. They cannot be attacked or they do die. But with the support, able to push Magical's forces back. Magical, desperate to defend against this. It's just not working out for them. Warden is here. For Magical, but Eatlander already had this effort to defend. And with that, Magical throws in the towel, and Eatlander takes game two. Complete reversal of fortune from the last game. And I gotta say, well done to Eatlander for calling that... Calling the whole thing. Just completely wiping it out. The cheese failed. But it was good cheese. It was, it was a solid... It was a solid piece of cheese. You know? Nice block of of cheddar. Just just right there. Nothing too fancy, just quick units inside of your opponent's base with a couple of turrets. Yeah. Solid cheese. Oh. Now game three back on frontiers. is on the way. Alright. We s Itlander knows Magical has has tricks up their sleeves. Magical back to Mala. Likely going to go for a quick Ikor speed. Itlander staying in a Jari this time. Looking for an early expansion. Last time, Eatlander lost on account of being unable to defend their natural expansion from the Speed Icors. This time, we'll see what Eatlander can build quickly enough to deal with them. I see no reason for Magical not to go for the same build as before. Oh, and Aether first as well, which does signal... Getting enough ether quickly enough to get that early, the early amber womb. Of course, Eatlander won't be able to go directly with the party. They basically have to switch quickly into Zephyr, or quickly into Soul Foundry. And Eatlander went for a bit of a slower ether expansion or ether extractor. So getting that early Soul Foundry is not an option in time. Like, Magical's gonna have no problem. They will get that early Soul Foundry. They're fine. They're on track. Sorry, early Amber Room. They're on track. Eatlander does not have that going for them. So what do they think he needs to defend? That... That is a tough question. Choices of Pari is going to be tricky. It's, it's, I have to keep an eye on Aidlander, what tech they use. Magical. They have, they are going for it. I don't know if Aidlander scouted it. They probably just figure, you know, Magical gone for Aru. 
were on Frontiers. Magical has shown that they really like to go speed icon on Frontiers. I would expect possibly Absolver, just because that is a heavier unit that's reasonably okay dealing with their opponents. But again, it's the range issue. The, the fact that in the new patch, like, Absolver, like, Adelander won't be able to be defending this entire opening with an Absolver. The Icor will outrange them. I suppose Dervish might work. I'll definitely con let Eatlander contest magical speed for speed. Well, in any case, Eatlander at least will have the advantage of Pyre. If nothing else, they will be able to set up Heaven's Aegis pretty quickly. They'll be able to get... Well, maybe, maybe Magical actually does get that first Pyre Camp. So, advantage Magical. Eatlander still has the opportunity to get their... Well, to get Heaven's Aegis, but it's just not as good as it could have been. Magical coming in, sneaking that win, and now Eatlander has to fight on the back foot, having not set up yet. Early Absolver is the choice. It is still under production. And these Icor essentially have free reign. Speed is on the way. It's not quite there yet, but it is on the way. Once speed is up, this is kind of over. Ah, okay, Eatlander. Smart positioning on this Absolver, making sure that the moat line is protected. That is the key target. As long as that stays around, then it's fine. Saushin coming in as well. We've seen before Saushin will slow things down, so Eatlander has a Saushin to stop Magical from just running around willy-nilly. The Icor will be slowed down, and that will give the give Eatlander's Absolvers a lot more time to hit. Just generally allow Eatlander to take everything out. The slow aura comes through. Doesn't kill any Icors, but hey, it's that's the first step. Fortunately for Magical, they don't have a lot of resistance to actually fight against. Eatlander slowly but surely getting their army up. Slowly, however, is the operative word. Warren's coming in as well. Eatlander with better anti at this time. The Absolver does go down. An opening has been made. Magical takes the opening. Wardens are up. Well, a Warden is up. It looks like it's just going to be insufficient. It's again Icor Thrum running roughshod over Eatlander's base. Eatlander trying their best. It's just simply not enough. There isn't enough of an army to actually stop this. The Thrum able to wipe out the Warden. Eatlander is... Are they... I'm looking kind of desperate. Oh. Oh, yeah, they're right. There is a bit of an issue with the mining. Huh. Eatlander was pointing out in chat that there might have been an issue with mining with the... With the moats clumping up, there has been a slight change to the mining. It's now, like, four nodes instead of three. With eight moats instead of six. It appears there might be some small issues when it came to how that works. So, well, that is part of what this tournament is about. Is breaking the game so that we know what needs to be fixed. Hopefully, let me get that whatever has been messed up sorted out. We don't want to have too many game-breaking bugs, but still, that was the game that it was. So, magical. 2-1 against Eatlander moves on to the Grand Finals. San and Wajizu are currently in what I believe is game one. And I will be checking that out as soon as we get the players ready here. 
Yeah, so Santa and Wajazoo are the other side of this bracket. Actually, also, Mr. Kareem is... Oops. Mr. Cream against Datelander will be in the loser's round. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah, people asking about the Ajari thing. Ajari is currently been rather popular like Orism like Orism's strength was heavily coming out from Absolvers and Absolvers got nerfed while well, at the same time the Saushin got a massive rework that lets them just rip things apart So it's a little so currently currently it is at least a popularity win for Ajari. I don't know how that's, how long that's going to stay the case. I think that Ajari is probably going to end up being a little bit less dominant just as people start to figure out what to do with Orzum. Or maybe start to figure out what's going on with Absolvers and how best to use them. But that will be... That will remain to be seen. Santa Claus is going for Orzum here against Wedges, though. If anyone's going to figure out what to do with Orzum, it is going to be Santa Claus. They're absolutely... like They are an Orzum main, first and foremost. And that has been the case for a long time. Now, what that means generally, I don't know, but, like, again, we'll, we'll see what happens. I really am curious what they're going to come up with. Like, I really am curious, because it's, like, I, the Absolver nerf seems like the thing that's causing a lot of the grief. So I'm thinking, you know, what else do they have? They have hollow ground options with Sapar with Zentari, they have things just in general. What oh. Okay, apparently they're no wait, wait. shit. <sighs> Wait, no, what? Ah. 
Hey. <sighs> All right. Let's try to get this going again. All right, there we go. Hey. So yeah, Orzum, Ajari, Canyon. Let's go. Let's get this thing started. Let's get this thing sorted. Because I want to know if Orzum has any options that they actually have that'll work here. I assume they do. Again, Santa's the one to show it. But I really can't theorycraft anymore. Just have to see. Just have to wait and see. What is being done? Presumably not Pillar Rush. I can only assume that much. Okay, why is it so? Going forward with the moat. Looks like we will have another bit of... Well, okay, attempt to be sneaky. The moat will get scouted. But not the Legion Hall. I'm not even sure if Santa saw that, to be honest. Going for the other expansion. I don't think Santa actually saw that moat. Things just happen to be on the edge of their vision. They just barely missed it. And they don't know there's, in fact, a forward, not quite proxy, but forward Legion Hall from what is so. Might have figured it out by now, though. It's like, wait a sec, there's two Aether and no expansion. What's going on? It's like, where, where is this going? Why is there nothing built up? Double, okay, proxy double Legion Hall from what is so. They they want this. They want to win now. They have, they have absolutely no chance. I like Santa Claus. Like if there is a chance for Wajizo to take this, it is going to be through the double proxy here. The proxy double Legion Hall. It's a bit of a distant proxy, mind you. Again, there is a tower right here that's going to make pushing through much harder. Now, granted, if Watchazo comes through the other side and pushes in, then it is possible. Also, this scalping here means that Santa probably actually has seen it. Oh, wow. Triple Legion Hall before expansion. One base Triple Legion Hall Saushin rush, I guess? Yeah. That's exactly right. So I was about to say, maybe if they break down these rocks, they avoid the tower, and that's something, but... No, they don't have to. They could go up the, up the slope here. And judging by watches those scouts, that is their that is the intended path. Let's go around down the canyon, up the other side, through the top, and then get some damage in. I mean, it has been like Santa knows full well what's happening. There's there's no surprise. I mean, sheesh, quadruple Legion Hall forward one base. This is the most commitment I've ever seen to an attack like this. At all. Ever. In the entire history of this game. I mean, granted, you know, the production changes from a few patches ago definitely shift the dynamic a bit, but still. This is nutty. Saushin coming in immediately. Trying to get rid of the Zentari. It's... I mean, Saushin are strong, but Zentari are just... Much stronger, especially once they get in the hollow ground, especially once they get that range attack. Start focusing down. Like, Santa can just focus down all of Wajazoo's forces one at a time. Just pick them off. Wajazoo forced to pull the pull the attack away, but if you can't you can't really force Orzum to leave. And if you can't force Orzum to leave, you can't win off of an aggressive attack. Like this this is not an economic basis. This is not Wajazo gradually building up a force that they can use to to take the map out from underneath Santa Claus's feet. It is 
an attack designed to smash through Santa Claus with a force that, quite frankly, does not have the firepower to do this. Especially not into hallowed ground. Like, that's, that's the key problem, is into hallowed ground. Now, I mean, if Watch This does get enough pyre, they might be able to start... They might be able to pull out some shenanigans. Heaven's Aegis would help a bit. Salvation would be more helpful, but even then, it's kind of wonky. Like, I don't know. Honestly, it is... It is not Wyshizzo's game right now. Santa Claus has the advantage. Wyshizzo, they do at least have this expansion, so they aren't dead in the water, but they're not focusing on map control. They're not focusing on getting there on expanding. Because that is that is a typical way. Santa Claus is defending. Wyshizzo needs to expand. Like Santa Claus is not going to contest Wyshizzo if they expand, so Wyshizzo can just take the map build a significantly larger army, and that means they have the bodies, they have the resources to get the bodies to gradually grind through Santa Claus's bases. Wajazo does have the one expansion, which Santa has not spotted, the scepter going the wrong way, and Wajazo having spotted that coming in, they can keep that up, then avoid the economic damage, then there's something there, but Santa Claus knows mm, the possibility exists of expansions. Why does so? Knows the possibility exists of Santa Claus scouting it out. Oh, but the scepter. No, it's not! Not even close! Running away from the Zephyrs, but these South these Zephyrs, the Zentari don't even care. Like, they actually aren't even coming near this expansion. Are they gonna They're not gonna spot it. Santa Claus has no idea. As far as they know, Wajizo simply has not expanded yet, and is on one base. Santa figuring that that's the case, going for what could be the attack to break Wajizo's production line. Oh, and Wajizo's out of position! That position's gonna be the- that'll be their downfall. Santa Claus coming in. Up, like, the entire army up against two Saoshin, Wajizo hurting to reinforce. Does manage to avoid any losses, but... Damage is still damage. Santa Claus over gets surrounded on the second hit. Why just so? Able to pick off a few units here and there, but Santa already has teched into thrones. Why just so? While I have a bit of anti air, it's gonna be a significant challenge to use that against everything Santa's built up. Again, why just has just now barely gotten the on par economy? They haven't even started to expand ahead of Santa, and Santa's already getting the third. So why is it though, they have, they, they have to push. They have to find some way of getting damage done to actually deal with Santa's army. They If they don't do that, they're, they are out of this game. Now, granted, they might not entirely be out of this game. Finding a position without the hallowed ground set up. Well, this is perfect time. This is the best timing for them. Santa has no hallowed ground to work with. They have apparently no magi either. No, they don't. They don't have a relic They went entirely for thrones. They have, don't have any way of getting hallowed ground remotely. Well plates. Why just so? Taking out Santa Claus's expansion. Slowing Santa Claus's expansion attempts. Their economy will not be quite where it used to be. Of course, that is still a little contingent on... Is this seriously going to go down? The castigator is right... Oh, that is so painful. The castigator is right there. Why? Zo, Move your castigator that's right in the base. No. Oh, that is that has got to hurt. As that relic right goes down, it's... It's not going to be fun. Okay, the reliquary at least will be safe. What the heck? Oh, height. Yes, height can be tricky. Well, bigger problem, though, for watches, though, the center production line is being wiped out. That is their supply. That is all of it. It's again coming through, but Santa has built a significantly larger army than the last time. The throne's coming as well. Salvation is cast. 
setting in an assault force through the dead. And it seems Santa's caught wise to that. Has the throne in place to stop them, and there is nothing to heal. Why just though? They just threw the game away. Yeah, unfortunately for the current Ajari, Salvation, while it's easier to set up and does a bit more, there is no healing off of it. Like, if Saushin die quickly in the old version where Saushin healed, they would heal on the on arrival, which is actually why the whole teleport salvation or delete salvation thing even worked. But that's no longer how it works. Saushin don't heal, so nothing Nothing really heals a Jari in the field unless they have some way of getting hollow ground. And there were no Ark Mothers. And now Wajas though has no supply. Like they have they're desperately rebuilding their supply structures. Kind of surprised they hadn't expanded naturally. Like they hadn't expanded along the natural third, whatever. They've got a ton of alloy. They only have the one expansion. That's like yeah, again, like, why does it needed to be expanding against Santa Claus heavy defense? And they just didn't. They're expanding a bit now. It's just, that's not, that wasn't when, like, they needed to expand five minutes ago. That's, like, uh, it's unfortunate for why does I mean, they are... Expanding around, at least they just, I mean, apparently very scared of Santa Claus actually finding straightforward hits, like finding the actual expansions, going for these side expansions. And I can't say I blame them. I mean, they really didn't have the army to go up against Santa front, like Santa's front line directly. It's just, you can't really set up that assault force if your opponent can start picking out your expansions one by one, once they find it. Like, Santa hasn't been scouting, which is, like, that has been an issue for Santa. I'm surprised they haven't been scouting, to be honest. But they have not been scouting these expansions. Which is the one reason why Jezo has been able to get away with them. Because otherwise, it's just how you can't defend them. There's nothing to defend. Why Jezo last stand... I think burning the pyre they have, trying everything to set up. It's just... It may be too little too late. Again, the expansions are being built up. That does mean Majizo has been the double expanding. That's investing a ton of resources outside of their army. Has not yet paid off. It'll take a couple minutes to pay off. And Santa Claus is already at their doorstep. Majizo does not have a couple minutes. They have a, They have no time whatsoever. Hoping for the best of this wall up does something. It is... It's not going to. Right, they're trying. The Ark Mothers are just out way too late. And no way of stopping this Antari exists for Wajazo. Santa Claus. Slow but steady Orzum push. Does the trick. Now Wajazo will likely be holding on for a little while. They do have three expansions. All scattered around the map. So if Santa Claus doesn't find these... Wajas is going to at least try to rebuild, but, like, how? With what? I mean, Santa Claus probably clued in by now. It's like, oh, there's expansion somewhere, because I didn't win. Like, I didn't, this wasn't the only Acropolis in the game. Again, it's not really going to matter. So, yeah, we found out today that Saushin do not just beat everything. They're good, they just don't completely wipe the floor with everything. Mojizo. One of the expansions has been scouted. The other two remain untouched. Santa Claus is getting a fourth of their own. I mean, as soon as any of these scouts find it, and, they, and Santa knows. Like, they're, they're just running around seeing if they find any anything proxy, anything hidden. This entire game has been just Mojizo hiding everything. Hiding their early production, hiding their expansions, hiding their... Not really hiding their tech. That's one thing they haven't really hidden, but yeah, everything else? No. Why is it so keeping it hidden? And now we play the base destruction game. 
where Santa Claus sets up towers everywhere and then starts just wiping everything, wiping the floor with everything because they've found the expansions. They have the power, they have the military might. And Wajazo realizes it, throws in the towel, and Santa Claus moves on to fight Magical in the winner's finals. So, let's see what is up next. So, Magical and Santa Claus. Hey, this one, we just follow them on stream. And covering the rest of the tournament, we do have a loser's bracket. And loser's bracket has been... What the? Okay, Eatlander and... 